Well, with um, all that's been uh, going on in the news as of late, there's been a lot of conversation about war and rumors of war, as the Bible says. Um, Israel, of course. Uh, on Wednesdays, we've been praying for the conflict that's going on in the Middle East and praying for Israel and praying for Palestinians and praying for our, uh, Iranians and praying for generals and presidents and children and the trauma that's being inflicted on an entire region of the earth, um, praying, uh, standing against principalities as they seek to, uh, to sow discord and strife in the earth. And, and so um, as I've been doing that, I, it, you know, it's always such a, a challenge to, um, to see Jesus rightly in each and every season of life. And as I saw it over the last few Wednesdays, to see Jesus rightly in uh, through the lens of this current conflict, um, I wanted to bring the thoughts that I'll bring this morning, which is about this particular characteristic of Jesus that he has. I think the apostles, uh, I think in every generation, these are the 11, 11 apostles up, up there. Uh, Judas didn't make the, didn't make the, the list. Uh, but the, that's an artist sketch of the other 11. And uh, the apostles had, uh, they held three things simultaneously that I want all of us to hold. Now, they, hold, they held many more than three things, and there are many more things that we could put on this list, but we only have enough space for one sermon, right? So there's something unique that the apostles held that they got from Jesus, and it helped them to walk through battles and conflicts and injustice in a Christ-like way. And I think if we don't carry these three things, then um, we will fail in some way. Will fail in some way to be able to navigate difficult seasons, whether uh, wars stay thousands of miles away like they are right now, or if wars come close in our lifetime to our shores, um, we will need to hold things like this in order to be able to navigate those rocky seas. And so three things that the apostles, uh, you can tell from their writings in the New Testament, held simultaneously that really helped them deal with battle and injustice. Number one was a Christ-like love for all. A Christ-like love for lost souls, um, for all people, for all that are in authority, for Nero and every one of his henchmen, and for every other leader in every other city where uh, men dwell. They had a love for those people, a love for neighbor, a love for brother, a love for church member, a love for all because of John 3.16 and Christ's model. And then they had a hope for national Israel, people who had the blood of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, there was this hope that the apostles had for a future time in which a great number of those people would come to faith in Jesus. The apostles held that hope. We'll show you that. And then lastly, at the same time, a longing for God's warrior, Jesus, mighty God, heaven's warrior, Rusty said it this morning, um, it, was, it was prophesied in its clearest form in Revelation 19 that Jenny read a longing for the day when the scripture Jenny read becomes a reality. When God's warrior breaks through the clouds and comes to the earth to bring justice, the balance scales, and a sword. Jenny said that uh, in the vision that John saw, that there was a sword coming out of Christ's mouth, right? There's all sorts of things that that means, but... If we don't have a heart for lost souls, a Christ-like love for all, then we won't pray for the people we're supposed to pray for. We won't love the people we're supposed to love, and we won't bless others as we should. And at times, we'll be driven to hate people. So hatred will drive us if we lose this Christ-like love for all, especially in the case of violence and evil. We'll be driven to hate, and Christians should never hate another individual. Because love is the power that breaks hatred and that breaks evil. So we have to hold on to this Christ-like love for all, yes, even our enemies, right? If we don't know the significance of Israel in the middle, we won't see the spiritual warfare behind the conflict that surrounds the region of the Middle East. How come the Middle East is always in conflict? Well, if we don't understand uh, the hope for national Israel that the apostles had, and therefore then the spiritual warfare around that region, if we don't know that, then when we say, why is there so much conflict in the Middle East, we'll talk about oil, and we'll talk about 
democracies and theocracies, and we'll talk about religious fights, and we'll talk about land wars, and we'll talk about hundred-year-old treaties and things like that, which are all surface level. There's this much higher arching um, spiritual warfare behind the conflict, and that's why the region is so plagued with warfare. We know that because we're Christians and we know the scriptures. And then number three, if we don't have confidence that Christ is a justice warrior, then when tragedy comes or when evil triumphs on a day, right, when, when it seems that evil has won on certain days, then we will either despair or we will try to take matters into our own hands. If we're not confident that God's warrior is coming and he will balance scales, he will bring justice. If we're not confident in that, then we'll try to make justice happen ourselves or we'll despair that no justice is in the earth, right? So all three of these are important to hold at the same time. And maybe we'll touch on all three of them today, but the one I'm going to focus on the most is that one on the far right, talking about Jesus as uh, God's warrior. So the prophets whom God used to write the Bible were all awaiting the day when God, as a mighty warrior, Jesus, leaves heaven and comes to earth to defend his family and defeat his enemies. This is something that every single biblical author had in them. Every prophet of God held this, this hope. That a mighty warrior one day, God as a mighty warrior, would break through the clouds, leave heaven, come to earth to defend his family and defeat his enemies. That was so, it was, it was, this was essential to their worldview, and it's essential to our worldview. This isn't something that's talked about a lot in the church because on Sunday morning, typically you want to just welcome people into the family of God and give them a big hug, right? <laughs> well, sometimes um, there's some aspects of Christ's character that we need to highlight regardless of how a first-time visitor would respond to it, right? Okay, so I'm going to read you like 40 scriptures right now. So just settle in. That way you're not going to have to be like, how many scriptures is he going to read? It's about 40 verses I'm going to read where I'm just going to show that biblical authors in every era had this hope in a way that they talked about God as their warrior king who's going to come back someday. Okay? So you ready for it? See where we're going? Here we go. Let's go. Jude. Hey, I got you in the sermon. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote this about Enoch. Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation after Adam. That's a long time ago. That's before the flood. He said, he prophesied, saying, Listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things they have done and for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And Jude, Jude lived after Jude, Jude lived at the same time as Jesus and then outlived Jesus because he died on the cross. Jude, a first century apostolic leader, is saying, we're still holding on to this promise from the days of Enoch. I mean, 4,000 years ago, Jude? Yep, we're holding on to that promise. Psalms 2, why are the nations so angry, David asks. Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against Yahweh and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they cry, and free ourselves from slavery to God. That's how unbelievers look at religion, slavery to God, to free ourselves from that religion. But the one who rules in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then in anger, he rebukes them, terrifying them with his fierce fury. For the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem, on my holy mountain. The king proclaims Yahweh's decree. Yahweh said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Only ask and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. Now the father is talking to Jesus, the son. I'll give you the nations as your inheritance. The whole earth is your possession. You will break them with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. Now then, you kings, act wisely. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve Yahweh with reverent fear and rejoice with trembling. Submit to God's royal son or he will become angry 
and you will be destroyed in the midst of all your activities. For his anger flares up in an instant. But what joy for all who take refuge in him. Isaiah, writing about 300 years after David. Who is this? He sees in a vision. Who is this figure, this man who comes from Edom, from the city of Basra, with his clothing stained red? Who is this in his royal robes, marching in his great strength? It is I, Yahweh, announcing your salvation. It is I, Yahweh, who has the power to save. Why are your clothes so red? As if you've been treading out grapes. I have been treading the wine press alone. No one was there to help me. In my anger, I have trampled my enemies as if they were grapes. In my fury, I have trampled my foes. Their blood has stained my clothes. For the time has come for me to avenge my people, to ransom them from their oppressors. I was amazed to see that no one intervened to help the oppressed. So I myself stepped in to save them with my strong arm. And my wrath sustained me. I crushed the nations in my anger and made them stagger and fall to the ground, spilling their blood upon the earth. That passage was quoted in Jenny's prophecy and revelation. I don't know if you knew that or not, but that passage was attributed to Jesus in that Revelation 19 prophecy. How about New Testament? You say, oh, that's Old Testament. All right, New Testament, Paul. God will use your persecution, believers in Thessalonica, God will use your persecution to show his justice and to make you worthy of his kingdom for which you are suffering. In his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you. And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus, they will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. When he comes on that day, he will will receive the glory from his holy people, praise from all who believe. Two more passages. Revelation 6. Now, we were just singing that blessing and honor and glory and power forever is Revelation 5. Now we're in Revelation 6. Then everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, every slave and free person all hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they cried to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne from the one who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. Who is able to survive? And then Revelation 16. You are just. The angels and all the saints proclaim as they watch the Lord prepare the earth for his return. You are just, O Holy One, who is and who always was, because you have sent these judgments since they shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, you have given them blood to drink. It is their just reward. And I heard a voice from the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, your judgments are true and just. Prophecy of all kinds is kind of like looking through a glass darkly. Everything that I just read about the future event of Christ coming back is prophecy. So I I just read to you, everything was prophetic that I just read. Prophecy of all kinds is like looking through a glass darkly. And while we don't know exactly what it will look like when Jesus returns, we do know by these verses and hundreds of others like them, that one day Christ will assume the role of the mighty warrior God, El Gabor. There's your Hebrew word for the day, Victor. Uh, El Gabor, mighty warrior God, El Gabor who comes to bring judgment on certain individuals in the earth. On that day, the life giver will swiftly and surely take the lives of his enemies. While this may be difficult for us to understand, uh, we confess with the angels that this is righteous, just, and even worthy of our praise. That being said, before you can praise him for that, there may be some things we need to work through, right? Right? Um, and so let's, uh, let's look at, let's talk first about uh, a, a possible cultural bias that we all have when we're coming to this concept. And then we're going to talk about just six commitments 
that are in the heart of Jesus about his return. Okay? Here we go. Recognize our, cult- our potential cultural bias. Many believers in the first century, when the Bible was written and the New Testament was written, many believers in the first century seem to have an aversion to the Christian virtues of mercy and grace because they lived in a harsh justice culture. First century, harsh justice culture. So when they heard about too much ooey gooey mercy, grace, and forgiveness, they're like, oh, that's kind of tough for us to swallow because this is a justice culture, right? Think about how easy it was to get Jesus crucified. Think of how easy it was to get John the Baptist beheaded. Think of how easy it was to get Stephen publicly stoned. Think of how easy it was to get 10 of the 12 apostles um, killed, martyred for their faith. It was a justice culture, a harsh justice culture. Remember, they would line the streets with crosses. Remember, they would burn Christians and, uh, for lamps for Nero's parties during the days of the New Testament. A harsh justice culture. They sometimes had difficulty with an inordinate amount of grace and mercy and love and forgiveness. It was something they had to work through. We're the opposite. 21st century, we live in a, um, um, we have an, an aversion to concepts of justice and judgment. Um, because, uh, well, we can be seen that uh, today the death penalty is seen as immoral by most. And each year, uh, our own justice system becomes increasingly weaker and weaker on crime. Therefore, many in our generation, believers and unbelievers alike, recoil at the idea of Jesus, heaven's warrior, coming to bring swift and permanent justice to the earth. Because we're in a grace and kindness and second and third and fourth and fifth chances culture So justice seems unloving. It's a cultural norm that we have to see and fight against and make our true north, whatever is in the heart of Christ, is what we have to align with, not what our culture tells us is acceptable. So how do we reconcile this portrait of Jesus with the Jesus that prayed for his executioners, that died for his enemies, and commands us to love our enemies? How do we reconcile that? This apparent contradiction has led many believers to either ignore this subject or modify their theology by reinterpreting hundreds of biblical texts and act like they say something that they don't really say. Every one of those texts is really clear. We don't have to modify them through some reinterpretation. They're clear. So we're not going to reinterpret them. We're not going to ignore them. We're going to stand with the apostolic writings that we've received We're going to stare at the heart of Jesus until that becomes a normal reality in what we all long for and expect and pray into. Um, The New Testament writers were able to hold these two things, this Jesus who died for his enemies, loves his enemies, commands us to pray for our enemies, and the one who's going to come back and bring swift justice to his enemies— They were able to hold this together because this is how Yahweh is. This is how Yahweh is portrayed in the Bible. Remember how Yahweh, um, remember how he revealed himself to Moses. He said, uh, let's see, maybe I have a verse here. This is Yahweh's character. Yahweh the Lord, the God of compassion. Now that's the God I like. I like the God of compassion, Dustin. I'm really comfortable with that God of compassion. And he's the God of compassion. It's the first quality he leads with. He's compassionate. The first thing we know about God, he's compassionate and he's merciful and he's slow to anger and he's filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. He lavishes unfailing love to a thousand generations. He forgives iniquity. He forgives rebellion. He forgives sin. But he he will not excuse the guilty. But I do not excuse the guilty, right? I can forgive the guilty. But if the guilty reject my forgiveness, I cannot excuse the guilty. I can forgive them, but I can't excuse them. And so the same thing. This Yahweh became a man in the Lord Jesus. And he's filled with all of these qualities. But at the end of that long sentence of the qualities that Jesus is filled with, he would look at you and say, but I do not excuse the guilty. I can't. It would be a violation of my justice. It would be a violation of my character. So I'll forgive the guilty but I will not excuse them. Okay, so with that as our backdrop, six commitments in the heart of Jesus, the mighty warrior God. Uh, I think it's going to help us navigate things like what's currently going on in the news. It'll help us to pray, align ourselves in prayer as we should. 
It'll help us to love Jesus more because the more clearly we see Jesus, the more we can love him and align with him, partner with him in the earth, um, and set us up to carry these things in unison that uh, the apostles carried. So number one, and I'll work quickly. The returning Christ is committed to bringing judgment to those who oppose his word and work in the earth. And each of these six were drawn from the verses. I won't show you how. They're all drawn from the verses that I read earlier. The returning Christ is committed to bring judgment to those who oppose his word and his work in the earth. Opposing God's word looks like a war on truth, a war on moral accountability, a war on godly wisdom, which we are living in a world that has, uh, that has uh, um, enacted war, right? Has waged war on moral accountability and godly wisdom. Sometimes you just listen to the news and you're like, is there, one, is there, somebody, is there somebody wise out there who can, use, who can use some godly wisdom for just a moment to deliver the news to us or to pass a law that makes sense, right? Opposition to God's uh, word looks like um, opposition to the exaltation of Jesus in any land. Anybody who says you cannot exalt Jesus here is opposing God's word. And of course, the scriptures themselves, burning Bibles and banning Bibles and making Bibles um, uh, contraband, making them illegal in any format is opposition to God's word. Uh, the um, Voice of the Martyrs, uh, they put out a map and they talk about how, uh, let's see, uh, the lightest color uh, in those nations, it is very difficult or dangerous to obtain a copy of God's word. Um, the middle color, I'm colorblind. The middle color is uh, illegal or highly restrictive, illegal to uh, own God's word or very highly restricted to own it. You can only have it in certain contexts and only the translation that they authorize. And then three, the darkest color is the nations that, uh, where the word of God is strictly illegal and only available through covert smuggling. So this is just one way to look at opposition to God's word, is like, what do nations say about the Bible? But look at, the, look at those dark colors. Look at the, think about the uh, hundreds of millions of people that live in those nations where that color is the darkest, where it is illegal, strictly illegal to even own a copy of this book. You can't have it on your coffee table. That's wild. That's, that's war against God's word, right? Uh, I'll just, uh, so there's a, I don't know if you can see it. Right in the middle of that picture, there's a little sliver that doesn't have any color. Can you see that little sliver? I'm going to zero in on it a little bit. Um, it's right there. Uh, so it's a little nation called Israel. One reason why, uh, spiritually, there may be a little bit of conflict around that. You see how all the colors are getting darker as they come closer to Israel, Right? opposition to God's word, opposition to what this nation stands for, opposition to this place. When Jesus does break through the clouds, where is he going? He's not going to China or Chicago. He's going to that strip of land right there. His feet will touch down on that earth, right? And uh, the last little bastion of, uh, of freedom to be able to have a Bible, to have a, a Hebrew Torah or a Christian Bible. So uh, that was, I thought I'd show you that little uh, slip, snip it there. Returning Christ is committed to bringing judgment to those who oppose his word and his work in the earth. Opposition to God's work would be uh, uh, making gospel evangelism illegal, making corporate church gatherings illegal, making public ministry illegal, and um, all of that is opposition to God's word and his work in the earth. And he has a commitment to bring judgment to those, to those leaders, to those people who say this is illegal and we'll use the strong arm of government or jail or persecution or death if you violate it. The Lord says, I'm coming for those enemies of mine. Number two, the returning Christ is committed to the just defense of his family members, both spiritual and natural, who have been persecuted or killed. Jesus has two human families. He has all the sons and daughters, all of you that he has adopted, right? And then he has this natural family, which are the physical descendants of Abraham. Right? Jesus, there's only one man in heaven right now, and it's Jesus. Everybody else is either an angel or a disembodied spirit without a, without a human body. But there's one man with a human body up in heavens, and he's a Jewish man. And so when he looks at Jewish people, he thinks, those are my, fam those are my family. I mean, strictly speaking, they're my family members. They come from the same people they come from. 
And he's committed to the just defense of his family, which is noble and right, right? If Rusty, if you looked at somebody persecuting your daughter, and if Rusty went and brought swift end to that persecutor, right? Doing whatever you got to do, using your force as a, as, a, as a father, right? Who loves his daughter. If you, um, with all those raging muscles of yours or whatever gun you have at home, if you brought a swift end, right? To some jerk who's trying to hurt Chloe, what would all of us do? Yes. A strong protector. Hallelujah, Rusty. Good job, right? And so Jesus says, there are people who are killing my family members and I'm going to go do something about it. And all of us should say, yes, that is right and righteous to do. Um, okay, so let's talk about his spiritual family first. That's believers. How many believers have been, have been, have been killed? G- Jesus' family has been murdered because they love Jesus. Over 70 million Christians have been martyred or killed in the last 2,000 years. 70 million. You think he's maybe got something in his heart that says, I'm going to do something about that? Over 45 million in the 20th century and over 1 million in the last 10 years. That's since 2013 to 2023, in the last 10 years. As long as Jude's been alive, a million believers in the earth have been killed for their faith. To remind us what a million people looks like, a million people would be everybody in um, uh, Cincinnati proper, Fairfield, Norwood, Forest Park, Sharonville, Blue Ash, Harrison, Springdale, Montgomery, Reading, Harveysburg, Kings Mills, Lebanon, Mainville, Mason, Loveland, Oregonia, Franklin, Morrow. Every one of those people. Right? That's, uh, that's, that's an amazing amount of people. That's how many Christians have died in the last 10 years because they believe uh, in Jesus. In Revelation, um, they say, uh, rejoice over her, over uh, Babylon, the world system, this world system. O heaven and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God hath given judgment for you against her. Saints, God, when Jesus comes back, he will give judgment for the saints who have died. Um, So a spiritual family, natural family. Paul talks about this in Romans 9. Jesus' heart for Israel, for national Israel, for unbelieving Israel descendants of Abraham, Jesus has a special place in his heart for them because of his family. It says, um, Romans 9, they are Israelites and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law. The Jews gave us the the law, right? The Old Testament, Uh, the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, right? Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ. So Paul's going to talk about national Israel, unbelieving Jews. He's going to talk about them in 9, 10, and 11. And he starts off by saying, as I talk about these people, let's just remember, this is Jesus' family according to the flesh. These unbelieving Jews. It's his kinsmen, his countrymen. A little later in Romans chapter number 11, he says, many of the people of Israel are now enemies of the good news. Well, hello, right? Many of the people of Israel crucified Jesus and stoned Paul, right? And kicked him out of synagogues. Many Jews in the first century were enemies of the gospel. Descendants of Abraham, but hating the gospel of Jesus. Yet they are still the people he loves, God loves, because he chose their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for the gifts, for God's gifts, and his call can never be withdrawn. So as um, Paul is writing to Gentile believers, non-Jewish believers in Rome, he says, when you think about Israel, just remember, God does love them with a special love, because number one, it's his family, like according to the flesh, because he's Jewish. And number two, God made a this covenant to Abraham, I know it was 2,000 years ago. It's a long time ago, guys, okay? Lots changed in 2,000 years, but he made a covenant to Abraham 2,000 years ago, and Jesus is really big on covenants. When he makes a covenant to a people, he sees it through in ways maybe that we don't expect, like still having a, a special covenantal love for Israel. I know they're not saved. I know they're unbelievers, And I know they have mixed blood now. It's not a pure bloodline like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I know it's been 2,000 years, guys. But still, these people, even though they're unbelieving, they have a special place in God's heart. 
So we as Christians today, 2,000 years later, can affirm Unbelieving Israel is a nation like every other nation in the world that Jesus died for. But they're not just every other nation. They're also a nation that shares a bloodline with Jesus, and God made a covenant 4,000 years ago with great-grandfather. So when they are persecuted, Jesus takes it personally. Uh, he said it this way in Isaiah. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. He was afflicted. When, when the people on the earth, whether it's God's spiritual family like us, we are adopted into God's family, or Jesus' natural family, the Jews, when we are afflicted, when they're afflicted, he's afflicted in a unique way, in a family way. And so we would expect that, number two, the returning Christ is committed to the just defense of his family members, spiritual and natural, who are who have been persecuted or are killed, and when he comes back on the day he busts through those clouds, that will be one of the commitments that is alive and well in his heart. Number three. Uh, the returning Christ is committed to the just defense of the innocents who have been slain. Oh, one of the most horrible things about the attack three weeks ago was the innocents, right? The innocent people, and they all talk about these people who went to uh, they were just at a music festival, right? I mean, these are innocent people. And they, if you're hearing reports, you're hearing about babies brutally being murdered and older women being brutally murdered, a Holocaust survivor, just awful, awful stories because they're innocents. And everybody on earth knows that it's wrong to kill an innocent one, right? Even though it's happened, even though it happens all over the earth, but every time it happens, it triggers something inside of us even if we're duplicitous in the fact that we justify innocence being killed all the time, when it happens again, it still triggers the inside of us because there's something in our humanity that says that's wrong, right? And there's something in Jesus' humanity and his divinity that says the killing of innocence is wrong and he doesn't get over it. He doesn't forget about it as he's, I do, right? Uh, I've grown up in an abortion culture. It's an abortion culture. I've never known anything except for a world that just celebrates abortion, celebrates the killing of the innocent, right? And so for me, the killing of the innocent is like, I can go meh to it, which is awful. But Jesus never goes meh to it. Never, right? Never. He's able to hold it all. The eyes of Jesus are in every place, beholding the evil and the good, the amount of innocent killing that he's observed in the last 6,000 years of human history is appalling. How has he not destroyed the whole world? How has he not done it again? How did he only flood the world once? How does he not flood the world every year on January 1st, right? To start over again. How can he observe what he observes? Oh, he's a God full of compassion. He's slow to anger. He's slow to anger. That's how. He has so much compassion and patience that he can endure a lot. A lot. But he by no wise clears the guilty. He doesn't just excuse this. He holds it, and there will be a day when he brings judgment to the earth, as he should. According to the World Health Organization, a secular organization, uh, there have been uh, 73, there are 73 million abortions performed here in the earth. That's the killing of innocents. There's killing of innocents takes all forms, right? Abortion is just one kind of it. And these are the numbers that I can grab a hold of that are the most shocking to my system. 73 million innocents are killed in the womb each year, according to the World Health Organization. And according to the World Health Organization, a secular organization, they said that in the last uh, 50 years, 1.5 billion babies have been, innocents have been aborted in the womb. 1.5 billion, that's all of Europe, all of North America, and all of Australia. Just in the last 50 years. Can you imagine the amount of innocents he's seen killed in the last 6,000 years? It's, a, it's appalling. All right, I, I worship the one who can hold all that and who can hold back his wrath for a second, right? Oh my goodness. That's the man that we serve. That's the man on the throne. And one day, he will come to defend the death of the innocent. We praise him because that needs to be done. Somebody needs to cry out for them. Number four, the returning Christ is committed to putting an end to all wars forever. All wars forever. When he comes on that day, there will be no war ever again. Um, I love this verse in uh, Isaiah 9. It's a famous Christmas verse, but usually people don't look at verse number five. 
It's a prophecy. It says, the boots of the warrior and the uniforms blood-stained by war will all be burned on the day when Jesus comes back. The warriors won't need their boots anymore because they're never going to war again. And their blood-stained uniforms, they'll be able to just throw away. They don't need to clean them. You're never going to need it again, bud, ever. Their boots and their uniforms can all be thrown away. Why? For a child is born to us. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. That's El Gabor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. In order for the Prince of Peace to bring everlasting peace into the earth, he's got to come back from heaven as the El Gabor, the Mighty God. He'll come back as the Mighty God. He'll put an end to all wars, and he'll usher in everlasting peace forever. What a day. Number five. The returning Christ is committed to executing his judgment alone without your help. Easy, Chris. Without your help, he'll do it alone. Just as Jesus won the war over sin, death, and hell alone, so he will defeat his enemies in the last day alone. He didn't need any of our help to go to the cross. We weren't qualified to do it, right? (laughs) We had our own sin. He had no sin. And so he could come in perfect righteousness and holiness, and he could alone enter into humanity in the womb of a virgin. Alone, he could fight temptation for 33 years. Alone, he could defeat the devil in the wilderness. Alone, he could defeat the devil in the Garden of Gethsemane. Alone, he could lay down his life on the cross. Alone, he could descend into the lower parts of the earth for three days. And alone, by the power of the Spirit of God, he could be raised to new life, right? He says, I, I'm, this is a solo mission. I'm doing it all by myself, right? That's how his first coming was. And then his second coming, same thing. It's a solo mission. We'll all be there to praise him for his justice, but he won't need one of us to wield a sword. Not one. He said in the verses we read earlier, I have trodden the winepress alone. From the peoples, there was none to help me. He alone is worthy to do so because he alone perfectly reflects the holy nature of Yahweh. He perfectly balances divine love, wrath, goodness, and severity. In the New Testament, believers in Jesus are never seen killing the enemies of God, and we will not fight on the day when Christ returns. It is Jesus alone who has the assignment to carry out divine justice. He has been anointed for this task. So what do we do when we, when we are abused, when we are hurt? What do we do? Well, we never pay back evil with more evil. <laughs> we do things in such a way that everyone can see you're honorable. We do, all, we, we do all that we can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, we never take revenge. We leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, God will take revenge. He will pay them back. And we trust in that. We've entrusted all of that to him. All the getting even stuff, all of that making you pay for stuff, we leave all of that to him. So therefore, that leaves us free, that if our enemies are hungry, we can just feed them. I don't have to worry, Joe. You've done so, if you've done something evil, I don't have to worry about making you pay. He'll make you pay. I can just say, hey, you got enough food to eat today? You got water to drink today? Can I help you in any way? Well, yeah, but Jared, what about the injustice? I mean, that's his job. My job is I'm just here to love you. I'd, lo- I'd love to love you. But you're not my enemy. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, Christian or conquer evil by doing good. This is our mandate. All judgment and vengeance is left to him, and I'm free of that to be able to love like Jesus until the day he comes back. Lastly, number six. The returning Christ is committed to partnering with his people to saturate the earth with the gospel of love and forgiveness until the day when his father says, go. Go. So we understand what he will do on that day and from this day unto that day. From right now until the time his father taps him on the shoulder, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the father. So if I'm the father, Jesus is right here. And there will be a day when the father looks over to the son and says, go. And he'll stand up and he'll go. And the day we've been talking about will happen. But he's waiting for the father to say go. That will happen on a day, a day in time, a day on our calendars. But today is this day, and there's a a lot of days between this day and that day. And what is Jesus doing from this day to that day? He is committed to partnering with his people, us, the church, 
to saturate the earth with the gospel of love and forgiveness. Why? Because he lavishes un, uh, uh, unceasing love on thousands, right? He's going to saturate the earth with the gospel of love and forgiveness until the day when his father says, go. Every enemy of God in the last generation will have been given internal and external witnesses to the truthfulness of who Jesus is and the understanding of the evil they are committing. The Lord's going to use the church, us, to spread his good news and his gospel, to spread the power of love in such a way where on that day when he comes back, the earth will be saturated with knowledge of who Jesus is, and everybody who has rejected it has rejected it with full understanding of who Jesus is. They'll see, oh, oh, that's who Jesus is, and that's the work that he's done, and that's why he did it. I don't want that. I want to kill instead. It'll be, it'll be a generation that is that black and white in which Jesus responds and says, okay, if you've made your choice, you're going to come back and bring justice to the earth, rightfully so. Here's how Jesus said it in Matthew. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. And Jesus right now is committed to saturating this globe with love, with forgiveness, with the power of the Spirit, with purified, holy people living as a living witness and testimony of who Jesus is in the earth and why he's so beautiful. I hear that, Gideon. It is clear to us at the Father's house that our generation is being called to the great preparation of the bride. King Jesus is presently raising up a people to walk in purity and power like never before in order to be able to saturate the earth fully with his love and forgiveness. There needs to be a bride walking in purity and power like no generation has ever seen. We're called to this. The spirit-filled bride will do the works of Jesus, overcome the enemy, reach the nation, and prepare the earth for the son's return. There's going to be such a global harvest between today and the day when Christ comes. Global harvest awaits us. It's in front of us. It's here. It's happening now. Jesus has given us a glimpse of his kingdom advancement. He's arrested our attention and we can't look away. We have freely decided to spend our lives cooperating with him to see his mission fulfilled. Purity and power. Spirit forward, introducing people to power. Why do we do it? Rafa rooms, right? All throughout the week. Why do we introduce people? Why are we helping people get their hearts pure, right? Why do we do that? Prayer meetings. Why do we meet every Wednesday? And why do we pray the way that we do? Why do we operate as the Father said? Why did Jesus rename us the Father's house as he did, right, a year ago? Why did he rename us the Father's house so that we can cooperate with him in this mission to saturate the earth, to raise up the bride, to walk in purity and power so that when he comes back, not a soul will be able to say, I didn't know. That's our mission. We've been commissioned with him. So we need to hold all three of these. As you watch the news this week, as you pray this week, as you talk to coworkers this week, as you talk to family members and they say, did you see the news? As you process your own scrolling and news reports, as you watch YouTube videos, as you hear about massacres, as you see Hamas on the rise, as you hear about Iran and, and you know, do they, or do they not have nuclear wars as all, as all of this uh, current mess unfolds before us? Like the Christians of all time, we just need to hold three things in tension. Christ-like love for all. A hope for national Israel. One day there's going to be a revival there. It's going to happen before Jesus comes back. And then a longing for God's warrior, entrusting all judgment and justice to him. 